First Sergeant Kev here with Company D, Sick United States Sharpshooters, and today we have another expensive book review for you. Today we will be talking about The Civil War Diary of Wyman White. Um, this book set me back just shy of $200, and I had been searching and searching, trying to find the best deal on it for a number of years, and I finally just said, you know what, it's just going to hurt, and hopefully... It's as good as I hope it is. And <clears throat> while I did kind of have my doubts after I hit that purchase button, uh, I quickly was just blown away by how incredible of a diary Wyman White's story is. For those of you who aren't familiar, uh, Wyman White uh, is from Company F, Second United States Sharpshooters. He uh, mustered in as a private and was mustered out as a first sergeant. And Wyman wrote this um, like 1917, 1918, uh, looking back over all of his notes and recollections during his time in the, in the war. And what's really compelling about Wyman's diary is it really kind of strikes at sort of like the realism of the Civil War that I feel um, it, it still gets lost, even with people who are committed to research um, and portraying an authentic um, persona, there's still sort of this underlying romanticism, um, this, this sort of like uh, strict um, civil norms and manner of being, and everything's very, uh, it's always disciplined and very militaristic when you're reenacting. And, and Wyman and other uh, Civil War diaries of sharpshooters really sort of gets away from that. And gets into like the real everyday life of soldiers during the war. Uh, it's, it's includes all the hard times and lack of food, lack of sleep, um, losing your comrades in battle, but also a lot of shenanigans and escapades and, um, a little bit of braggadocio, although all these diarists tend to be very careful to not come across that way. Um, but towards the end, uh, one example, um, Company D and the other sharpshooters and Co Wyman's Company F, we were um, merged into a regular infantry unit in 1865. And it bothered a lot of sharpshooters because Wyman noted, and it was sort of his rare moments of kind of letting it slip, how much they looked down upon the infantry. Because the sharpshooters were a special class of soldier uh, they operated differently, they uh, worked independently, and they had all this sort of reputation of being their own unit, with their own esprit de corps, and in that little thing of, at the end, of the sharpshooters kind of looking down on infantry um, and being reluctantly absorbed into regular units from their home state, kind of hints at some of the stuff that soldiers that wrote of their term of service in the Civil War usually don't touch on. And I, I feel that um, very interesting. Um, so I've bookmarked uh, several stories in here that, that capture a few highlights of some of the, the tales of Wyman White's experience. And it's going to be up to you whether or not this... I paid $180 for this book. And it's going to be up to you to kind of decide how important this is for your... Uh, collection or your research. Um, I bought this one and this will be uh, passed around and loaned out in our unit for everyone to enjoy. And I feel like that's a good way for people to get the most use out of expensive, um, low circulation books such as this. Um, Wyman White, as a general overview, um, is an excellent writer. Um, he writes with a lot of character and personality. It really draws you in and he really does a great job of sharing the, the fun moments that they had during the war, but also not holding back on the darkness and horrors of war. And he also, as a writer, really hits on the juxtaposition between um, sort of like the, the darkness and, and the humor in the midst of, of all that chaos. So let's go ahead and start with one of my favorite stories from Camp of Instruction. Um, the other thing, too, is if you don't portray Company F, uh, 
White talks about other units quite often in the second USS. And uh, Company D's mentioned several times in here. Uh, sometimes positively, and then a negative run-in with a temporary commanding officer that we had. So, uh, the sharpshooters, they, they um, met up and then they went down to Camp of Instruction. I think the, the very first one, I think the first U.S. went to was in Weehawken. Um, and then a lot of them also ended up in Wash outside of Washington, D.C. And it was a lot of boredom. The supplies weren't coming in yet. And so you have young men on their own, most of them for the first time, and uh, they found lots of trouble. And they also had tent mates. Now, Wyman White's tent wasn't great. Like They had a bunch of Sibleys, but it was super muddy, and they really wanted to get up off the ground. White uh, had admired Company D's uh, main Sibleys, because the main Sibleys had walls, which means that uh, the Mainers could make uh, short bunks to get out of the mud and get off the cold ground and make a, a much more, uh, better home. So the... So the sharpshooters would often run run the picket, um, which is against military law, um, and they could they could have been shot, they could have been arrested, they could have been discharged, all sorts of nasty military penalties could have ensued. But they would often not just run the run the picket um, to get drunk in town, um, which was hard to do because sharpshooters wore green uniforms and they kind of stood out. Berdan himself had rounded up a few errant sharpshooters in town because they stood out like a sore thumb. Um, but they wouldn't just, you know, run the picket to go and hoot and holler in town. They would uh, run into, they would run the picket to steal supplies to make their, their tents um, more livable during the camp of instruction. Um, and he had an interesting group of tent, a uh, group of tent mates, and one of them was Bamford. Bamford um, was well loved by everybody, um, but when he drank, he drank. He didn't drink all the time, but when he partied, he partied. And so they were supposed to go out scouting um, in D.C. to steal stuff to, to make their camp better. Um, but the group of them, including Bamford, managed to um, in, imbibe in some spirits. So here's one of the, the tales of them trying to narrowly escape running the picket. There were some very narrow escapes also. One evening, five or six of our company, all from the tent with me, ran the guard and went to the city to fill up with fire water. They came back to a brickyard near 7th Street to get some bricks to fix up our tent. But it happened, the guard was awake, and just as they thought they were all right, each one of his arms filled with bricks, the guard came upon them and called, Halt! They all ran and got clear of the guard, but one, Bamford, being very drunk, had quite an experience. No matter how drunk Bamford got, um, put him on his feet and he could walk, but let him lay or fall down and he would be asleep in an instant and nothing would wake him but putting him on his feet again. In this case, Bamford ran with the others, but ran off a bank and fell into a clay pit and, of course, fell fast asleep. The rest ran towards the camp, but they did not want to leave Bamford. So they waited until the guard had gone back to his place, and then they went back to find him. They had hardly got back into the neighborhood before they heard him snoring loud enough to wake the dead. They found him laying at the bottom of the pit in the muddy clay, with the bricks still hugged in his arms, and when they lifted him up on his feet, he started to camp as though nothing had happened. Bamford had to be helped to climb the steps at the door of the tent. From the top step, he made a dive for his bunk and went headlong into it, still holding onto his bricks, and he was sound asleep in no time. He was a comical-looking object as he lay there covered with mud from the top of his head to the toes of his shoes. <clears throat> and there's camp of instructions full of all sorts of interesting stories that you normally don't hear about in reenacting. Um, one was apparently the, the sharpshooters had this tradition if there was an unscrupulous subtler uh, or otherwise um, merchant trying to uh, hustle soldiers. Sharpshooters, and I, I, maybe other units did this too, but this is coming from the sharpshooter camp. And they, one of them would yell rally really loud 
that other sharpshooters would kind of pick it up. And what they would do is they would all run out of their tents and rob this unscru unscrupulous uh, sutler blind and then disappear before the officers could show up to punish anybody. Uh, so a lot of the tents had secret uh, caches of, of stolen items from unscrupulous uh, sutlers and merchants. Um, unfortunately, uh, Dear Bamford uh, uh, died later in the war, and he was missed by many. Um, so talking about Company D, uh, so we're in uh, 1862 now uh, at Centerville, um, and Wyman had been out walking around, and uh, in the afternoon, I went into a shady place under some trees to get some needed rest. It was Sunday, but I ran into the biggest poker game there that I had ever seen. As poorly as I was, I watched the game until it ended. One of the players was one of our regiment and a son of a deacon. He was from the state of Maine and a member of Company D, 2nd United States Sharpshooters. His opponent was from Indiana, and both of these men were professional gamblers and the champions of the Army of the Potomac. It seems that their admirers had brought the two together to see which was the better. The game was only one dollar ante, but one pot was nearly a thousand dollars. While I was watching the game, when they got through, the Hoosier said, I take it, pard, that I am some ahead in the game. No, said the down Easterner, I guess not. I think I am ahead. They then counted the money in the state of Maine, and the state of Maine man had one dollar more than he had when they opened the game. He pocketed his greenbacks with the remark, Well, I am satisfied. I have worked like hell all day for a dollar. Rather a hard lad for a deacon's son. So, again, you know, hijinks, um, entertainment, frivolity, um, even during wartime, this this diary really brings out the, the humanity um, and camaraderie of soldiers in a way that we don't normally see uh, through our regular research or, or our portrayals in the hobby. Um, and then I mentioned in my uh, How to Make a, a Shelter Tent video that uh, the New Hampshire boys didn't get shelter tents issued to them um, until just after Fredericksburg. But Wyman White managed to get his coming back from the battle as Company F was pulled back uh, into reserves. And as we were hurrying along, there was a soldier just a little ahead of me on the left of the column, moving along quite unconcerned. I think he was a servant for some officer, as he had a lot of cooking utensils that he was carrying, and atop of his knapsack, he had a very large roll of pieces of shelter tent. A shell from the rebels struck the ground a few yards to his right and bounding struck the struck his head without exploding and carried away his head and pitched his body headless almost into our column. None of the regiment had ever drawn shelter tents and when I saw that great roll of tenting on the knapsack I could not resist and I unstrapped the roll and took four of the six pieces from the roll and then rushed on to overtake my regiment. I gave two pieces to my comrade Wilson keeping the other two for myself. The four just made us the proper thing for a tent. Now, this was a big deal, and this is kind of a, a gruesome war story, but Wyman White and the other New Hampshire um, sharpshooters, I mean, they lost tons of sleep throughout the winter because they were just, so they wouldn't fall asleep and freeze to death. They only had their blankets, and they weren't the only ones. They would stumble upon other soldiers uh, huddled in, huddled up in burned out buildings, um, some soldiers near the, the brink of death from hypothermia, and they try to make as good of a fire in a blizzard as they possibly could to, to keep each other alive. So this was, this was sort of um, a really moving piece of battlefield pickup. And if you read the, the, the backstory leading up to this, it really puts it, this is, becomes like an overwhelming, uh, almost like a, like a dark celebration uh, for the soldiers to be able to, to have shelter finally. Um, then moving on. Oh, <laughs> so yeah, this one's a bit long, but, um, there's a story in here, uh, of Captain Barker. He was a sort of a short serving, uh, captain in company D and, uh, White talks about how incredibly rude 
Barker was to him uh, swinging his uh, rank around when they were all at the sutler tent. Um, and and eff effectively, Barker uh, made Wyman lose his, his turn in line, and it put him in like tears of rage as he filed his complaint. No one in company D liked Barker either. So, you know, it worked out for the better in the long run. But the, I mean, that was a two page uh, recollection uh, from Wyman. So it really, you know, it made it into the diary. That was something so memorable um, and so frustrating for him that it's forever written in here. So there's a lot of sharpshooter crossover. Um, there's a, a few stories on snowball fights, and um, one was just with us sharpshooters. So one afternoon, there was a light snow on the ground, and some of the boys of each regiment, ours and the first first SS, got to snowball snowballing. Soon more joined, and before a great and before a great while, nearly all the men in both regiments were hard at it. Charge and counter charge were made. Each man having the pride of his regiment at heart. The fight waxed hot, and some of the 1st Regiment men sneaked into our camp and stole our regimental guidons. They are small flags used as markers when the regiment formed in line. After they took the flags, they came around into their own camp and shook them at us. It was like shaking a red flag at a bull. Our boys charged over their men, and the fellows having the flags ran. We followed and caught them, wrested the flags away from them, and brought the flags back and put them in front of the colonel's tent. Then we defied them to come and come over and get them again. They made a charge with terrible fury, but we repulsed them. They charged again with pine limbs in their hands. Although our boys had no clubs, we repulsed them again. At this time, bad blood was up, and some of the men began to talk about getting our rifles, and if the officers had not ordered the men to their quarters, there would have been some bloodshed. I am pleased to state that the next day all the ill feelings had passed away and pleasant connections between the two regiments continued as before. <clears throat> um, so yeah, let's skip way ahead. So we, we also get a lot of questions uh, from viewers and uh, people at events about um, sort of, I guess, counter sniping. It wasn't a term then, um, but... Every unit had the target rifles uh, on the wagons because they were super heavy, they're incredibly delicate, and they were only taken off when they needed to. There were a couple of regiments, I believe in the first uh, U.S., that carried their own target rifles all the time out of personal preference, and it worked for them. But for the most part, um, the soldiers were happy to get rid of them. But later in the war, pretty much like uh, after Gettysburg, you start seeing the sharpshooters... Um, carrying the target rifles more. And when the sharpshooter had the target rifle, they had a free pass. They would not, they weren't to be stopped or harassed by any officer of any grade. If you saw a sharpshooter with a target rifle, he was working. And so Wyman White talks about several times of essentially counter sniping work. And he would be walking uh, around um, the battlefield and the, the general camp area, going out beyond lines, and trying to find targets or find um, officers or soldiers who were being pinned down by Confederate sharpshooters. Um, so one example uh, in a section called Sharpshooting for Andrew Fisher, to get, to, to get where I wanted to, I went directly back to the main line and came over the works into the 15th Massachusetts Infantry. Here, I met an old schoolmate, Andrew Fisher, a sergeant in the 15th Regiment, Massachusetts Infantry. Sergeant Fisher was in charge of the pickets of the 15th Regiment, and when he saw me, he said that I was just the man he wanted. He said a rebel had hit and killed three of his pickets, and he was very anxious that I should try and silence the wicked rebel sharpshooter. He had just shot and killed a corporal whose body lay in our view. Fisher pointed out the rebel's hiding place as near as he could. Major Rice of the 15th came up to us and in, in a very imperative tone ordered me to go to my regiment, probably thinking I was a straggler. I, being on duty uh, and doing my duty, duty to the best of my ability, answered him that I was doing my duty in obedience to proper orders. Sergeant Fisher explained my position to the Major, who partly apologized and left us, work, left us to work out a dangerous program. I told the sergeant that I was 
worth my life to get out where I wanted to as a rebel I had all the advantages until I could get a, get to a position where I could try titles with him. I said good day to Fisher and started on the very doubtful adventure. I worked my way from tree to tree until I got out near the body of the slain corporal. Then, to get to a tree that seemed to me to be the place to get a line on the dreaded Johnny. I took a quick run for a big tree. Before I arrived there, a bullet from the rebel came very close to me, but it seemed that I was moving faster than he calculated, and his shot passed behind me as I ran. I got behind a big tree, the roots spreading out quite a little above the ground. A better place I could not wish. I poked my hat out just enough so that he could see it, and zip went a bullet, and I think that I would have hit the hat if I had not kept it moving. I saw the Johnny smoke, and it gave me his position. I had good view. He was behind a large pine tree, which had three prongs and about 10 or 12 feet above the ground. They separated enough for him to fire between them and give him good protection. I waited until he fired again. Being all ready, I fired as fast as possible. I put about a half a dozen bullets just as near the spot he fired from as I could. The rifle being a breech loader and a self capper, I was not long in sending him half a dozen bullets. Then I waited a while to see if he would return my fire, but I got no return. After a bit, I put my hat out so he could see where to shoot. Then I stood partly out from behind the tree, hoping he would fire, and if he did, I would see his smoke and dodge behind the tree. Then, after giving him a parting shot, I stepped out and returned to the entrenchments where Sergeant Fisher had been watching me. He thought I must have hit the terror of a reb. I do not know as I hit him, but I silenced him. As Fisher told me, he had no more trouble from him after I got through with him. Comrade Fisher tells the story of my silencing his murderous rebel quite often to our native townspeople, which is not offensive to me, for if I should tell it to them, they might think that I was boasting. So again, you, you see like um, this this adventurous tale, um, and then sort of the the, the sort of the, the cultural um, civil cue that you don't want to sound like a braggart, um, and it, so it's nice that Captain um, the Comrade Fisher was continuing the story uh, even after they got home. Um, but it touches on a few things. Um, one, uh, White was using a breech-loading target rifle, uh, I believe, with a telescopic sight. Um, but he, he talks about firearms use during his term of service. And in one case, I believe, is at the wilderness. The sharpshooters knew they were in for; they're going to be going into some hard fighting. So the the sharpshooter, the the sharps rifle was designed for the the pellet primer system or the, the tape primers, the Maynard primers. And, and the way, if you're not familiar with the Sharps rifle, uh, the way that if you've ever had like a toy cap gun with the roll of caps, that was sort of the um, original intent for the, the Sharps rifle. Every time uh, you cock the hammer, it would spit out a, a pellet uh, re primer ready to go. Uh, early in the war, the soldiers and sharpshooters didn't care for them because they, they were only fair weather primers. If they got damp or wet or otherwise damaged, then you got nothing. Um, you're left at the mercy uh, of your dysfunctional firearm until you can get it repaired somehow. So a lot of those sharps just ended up, you know, the soldiers just ended up going straight to the uh, musket primers. But since uh, White knew that they were going to be hitting the Rebs hard, he actually went back to the primer system so he could shoot faster. And I believe in one day at the wilderness, he fired 190 rounds. Um, so, um, and then another, here's another interesting, uh, let's see, let's go, yeah, another counter sniping one, let's see, there's so many stories. Oh, okay. So there's a really great, um, funny story in here of how essentially Wyman White wanting uh, a new Tompion uh, to replace the one that he lost uh, saved his life. And uh, I, this is interesting because there's sometimes debate on um, on forums about the use of Tompions. Apparently White and some other sharpshooters preferred to use them, especially on marches and stuff like that, because if you're a sharpshooter, 
if you're gonna be called in the service, you need to make sure that your barrel's clean, right? So during this uh, during this time period, uh, our regiment uh, fell under uh, the temporary command of General Barlow, and uh, he was eventually arrested and court-martialed for cowardice not long after this. But this is a pretty harrowing tale of, um, I guess, dumb luck. General Barlow borrowed our regiment to act with his division in the movement to our left and the extension of our front. Our regiment led the column on the march. General Barlow took no precautions, but marched right into an ambush of rebels, and our regiment got the worst of it. Um, as luck would have it, I was not in it for this reason. As luck would have it, uh, we were marching on a road there where infantry soldiers marching abreast of us over a high rail fence right beside the road. I had lost the wooden, wooden Tomkin, as he calls it, out of my rifle. And as we marched along, I noticed an infantry soldier's Tomkin just hanging in the muzzle of his rifle. I called Captain Murray's attention to it and told him that when the Tomkin dropped, I was going to go get it. I climbed over the high fence and had just gotten over when the coveted Tompkin hit a fence stake and fell to the ground. I picked it up and walked along that side of the fence, hoping to find a place where the fence was down so I could get back into the road without climbing over the high fence. I did not return to the road until there was a fork in the road, and then I discovered that my regiment had moved along faster than I had and had gone out of sight. Which, uh, which of the two roads they had taken, I could not tell. I took the right-hand road, for it led more toward the enemy's lines, and I heard firing in that direction. I knew General Barlow had borrowed our regiment to do skirmishing, where he was intending to attack the enemy. I pressed on, expecting to overtake my regiment, passing all the infantry who were forming a line at right angles to the road. I followed along the road until I came to a curb, expecting to strike my regiment and skirmish line, but instead I ran into a rebel picket post or came within 15 or 20 yards, uh, rods of them. There were three of them around a small fire right in the road, and they were doing some cooking, for there was no other use of a fire that hot June day. They did not see me at all. And um, I turned and left as much distance between them and me as I could. The firing became quite brisk at that time, and I was soon on the left hand of the road and came to an open field, and there found my regiment, or what was left of it. The regiment had run into an ambush. Lieutenant Colonel Stoughton, commanding the regiment, was captured, as was Captain Murray of our company. Sergeants Griggs and Fallensby were wounded, and Sergeant Dodge was captured. Other companies lost uh, in about the same proportion. I was lucky enough to escape from being in the frazzle of a skirmish all through the picking up of a lost Tompkin. I was pleased, for I could have been of no use if I had been there, and I might have either been killed, wounded, or captured. As it was, I was spared to fight another day. The very end of that story um, gets uh, more explained uh, about the actual sort of like the, the battle scenario as Wyman kind of got caught up with his comrades. Um, and it also hints at some of the ongoing health issues that Wyman White had uh, throughout the war. And... Uh, oh, here's... Uh, I'll just do a couple more real quick. So, this one is called Finding and Digging a Well. <clears throat> so again, um, Finding and Digging a Well is another great story of camp life. And um, we, we, like, like I said, we lose a lot of that in reenacting. There's a lot of backstory uh, to make uh, our camp experiences more, more accurate and more exciting for ourselves and for spectators that might be around. Um, in our new camp, it was impossible to get pure water to use. There was plenty of swamp water, but to use it meant sickness and death. So the men of the regiment dug a well, and it was their first one in Virginia. We had always found good springs up to this time. The men of the regiment that was camped near ours dug a well in a ravine near, very near our camp. It was in the very lowest place in the hollow. They failed to get much water in their well, which was about 12 or 14 feet deep. Private Miller of Company H could find an underground spring or vein of water with a forked stick. One morning, Miller took a stick and started out prospecting amid the ridicule of his comrades, but his stick worked in spite of all their unbelief. Miller soon struck a vein and traced it until he came through under our camp. 
He followed along until he came to the side of the ravine about a rod from the well already dug as stated above. Here Miller stopped and said as he stood about halfway up the steep bank, Boys, you dig here and you will strike an abundance of water within 12 feet of the surface. Now 12 feet down at the spot would be on a water level just about as low as the top of the ground where the other well was dug. I must confess that I thought Miller must be beside himself or was playing the fool. Several comrades of Miller's company, led by Private Campbell, got some tools and went to digging like the Dickens, and inside of three hours they struck a vein as large as my arm, and the men at the bottom had to get out of the well in double quick time or be drowned. As Miller told them, they did not have to dig hardly 12 feet. The well was a wonder. The soil was of clay, and the boys got some pork barrels and managed to get them in from the bottom of the well. On one, on one on top of the other, so it protected the water from the washing clay from the sides of the well. When the water had settled, we found we had some very good water. We had enough so that I dare say 10,000 men were supplied from that well, and I never saw it used down to any extent, although a dozen or more men were dipping it out all the day long. In all the time we were in front of Petersburg, Miller never failed to locate a good spring by use of the stick, and the boys never got fooled in digging for them. So yeah, some, some water witching tales going on. Um, again, we uh, later in the war, um, Petersburg saw a lot of uh, independent sharpshooter work, and Wyman would be out uh, on, on picket or sharpshooting and um, catch you know capture. Um, rebel soldiers. He talks about when he captured a, a rebel captain uh, who was actually unarmed. Um, and that story is really good. Um, not just because like, oh, wow, Wyman White caught an officer. He caught, he captured lots of officers. It wasn't that big of a deal for him. Um, but the way that he wrote about his, his fear and anxiety, um, because if you're on your own as a sharpshooter, you, you know, you're not going to get any sympathy from the enemy. But if you're out sharpshooting or you're out on picket or out on patrol or whatever you're doing and you see a rebel officer, what's a soldier going to think? Where are the rest of the men? So then he, he kind of like walks through like his parent, you know, his paranoia. Like, how did I miss this? Um, do, wh where would they be coming from? Uh, I, I saw some, some men go that way earlier. Are they, are they attached? And it, 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 he he builds it up really well, and uh, you really feel like you're there living the experience with him. Um, and interestingly enough, it was just a rebel officer who had uh, known that the Union line was weak there, and he would just take casual reconnaissance strolls. And since no one ever harassed him, he just left his sidearms um, back in camp, and it was just sort of White's lucky day. And they had a really nice chat um, being walked back to the Union camp where he's turned in as a prisoner. Um, okay, so here, here's... <laughs> uh, so this, I believe... Yeah, so this is... We're getting really late in the war. Uh, the uh, sharpshooters are at uh, Fort Sedgwick, or as uh, they called it, uh, Fort Hell. And uh, they... Again, talking about different ways of setting up your camps. You know, once once you kind of get to like uh, the the whole Petersburg, once you get to Petersburg and you start getting into siege warfare, and there's all it's it's you know almost like a like a glimpse of what World War One would become. Uh, lots of bombardments, uh, lots of bomb proofs being done. Sharpshooters spent plenty of time um, digging bomb bomb proofs, um, and so one story that White. Uh, wanted to share of his experience, uh, building, you know, a better shelter. We put up logs in the ground to give support to the logs laying horizontal on the upright ones and then banked earth on top of the logs a foot to 18 inches thick. This mechanism would, as a general thing, stop the bombshells, but not always. Sometimes they would break through the whole thing and disarrange things to say the least. One case I heard of, a soldier was mending his pants, not having an extra pair to put on while he was doing the job. He sat on the ground in his bomb proof, sewing away in the position of a tailor, when at work. Without stopping to wrap, a rebel shell 
came down through the cover of his bomb proof, passed between his legs, went into the ground and exploded, throwing him head over heels. Very strange to say, the man was unhurt. I presume he finished mending his pants before he rebuilt his bomb proof. <laughs> so, I mean, again, it's just this great narrative style of Wyman White's. And I'll close... Um, was something that I had never heard of. Uh, I learned all kinds of great new things uh, in this diary. And this is something called squibbing. So uh, White was doing a lot of, um, you know, advanced picket duty. Sometimes they'd be within 20 yards of the rebel pickets. Um, and he would, and both, picket duty's boring. And he talks about how both sides were equally bored of picket duty. Because you're out there, it's, it's dangerous, you're kind of doing nothing um, for long periods of time, and you're often within talking distance. And so the trading would be going on. Um, although sometimes, you know, a red would uh, throw some tobacco and it falls short of a soldier's cover. Um, so they had to wait till nightfall because while those two soldiers may have had a deal. That doesn't mean another picket down the line knew about it. So um, they just waited till it was dark and he'd you know, run out and get his tobacco. But one example of uh, picket uh, shenanigans. The pickets often shot what they called squibs. That was to load the rifle as usual, then moisten the powder of another cartridge and put it down on top of the cartridge in the rifle barrel. This prank was played after it was dark by pointing the rifle into the air about 45 degrees, muzzle up, and then let her go. The damp powder would leave a trail all along the muzzle of the rifle until it struck the ground, which looked like a fuse of a bombshell with its fuse burning all the way over. One night as we lay in the trench watching the trails, one of the boys began to shift around saying, that squib means me, and he moved quickly along the trench when, sure enough, the bullet of the squib came down and went into the ground in the very spot of the comrade, in the very spot the comrade had just left. Sometimes the pickets used to shoot ramrods back and forth, and it was comical the drawn out, variegated hissing noise they would make passing through the air. Thus, we can see that grim war has its humorous side as well as the drama, and I might say religion. So, um, yeah, very expensive book. Uh, you'd be. I've never seen it for less than $150. Um, I've seen some copies go way in excess of $200. Um, who needs this book? Um, it's very sharpshooter specific. Um, so if you're a unit or you're, uh, even if you don't reenact, you're just a historian who's passionate about sharpshooter history, I would say this is sort of a must have. Yeah, it is expensive, but I would say it's absolutely worth it. Do I wish that they would reprint it and this would be like $20? Absolutely. Um, but you get so many of these um, short run, you know, small batch uh, publications that over time the value just goes up and up. Uh, if you have, a, if you can find a deal on one, I'd say snag it. Uh, for the casual Civil War historian, probably not. Um, unless you like to collect books. Or you just want to be able to read something that very few other people have. Um, and if you are in a uh, Berdan reenacting unit, uh, it might be a good a good way for maybe uh, all your comrades to kind of pitch in a little bit and you buy a company copy and that way everyone can kind of share it. I feel like um, there's it's important to kind of have those conversations with your unit to, or, or even with yourself on how to like pull your resources and use them uh, effectively enough to get the otherwise difficult to get source material that our hobby needs. Um, just because um, information is hard to get or expensive to get doesn't mean we get to ignore it um, because there are facts and history in here that we're responsible for knowing. Um, if you're brand new to reenacting, you don't need to know it right away. And there's tons of um, company history, um, company D, uh, we, Matthew's diary is fairly affordable, but there are other sharpshooter books, um, that could, you know, easily cost you 
40 to 150 dollars but there are plenty of um less expensive ones to 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 get your time and there are also other books available on google that you can read for free uh like charles augusta stevens book i think that's free on google and that's like it's like 600 pages of sharpshooter history uh stevens isn't is uh compelling a, a, of a writer as Wyman White is, but Stevens was the historian of the sharpshooters. So he was, he's going to be much more factual uh, and a little more dry than the exciting narrative of Wyman White. There are so many more stories in here. I just want to share a little bit so you get a taste of it to hopefully uh, help you be a little more informed as to the uh, research options out there, uh, book reviews out there. Um, let us know if you have any questions uh, about this book or other books. And uh, as always, uh, thanks for liking and subscribing. If you think someone else would be interested in this video, please share it. Uh, our Facebook page and our website are all down below in the description. Thank you so much as always, and we'll see you next time.